Well, thank you uh, for that introduction, Gary. I, I really especially appreciated the last line, um, which was the fact that it didn't rain. I'd like to think that maybe I could take credit for that, except that unfortunately we did need the rain. So um, it's really great to be here uh, and to see how this event has evolved over the 10 years, and it's now a decade since uh, I first began coming here. It's really a testament to the good work and commitment of the Climate Action Reserve and also to the many other professionals in California and beyond who have been putting their minds to work, uh, taking on the challenge of climate change. I too was going to cite that uh, great line that uh, Cliff used at the end of his talk uh, from the sayings of our boss, Governor Brown. Uh, the line about how we need courage and we need creativity and we need boldness to tackle climate change. But I would add to that something else, because in addition to boldness and courage and creativity, which our governor and many others that are working with him uh, share, um, we also need something else, which is smart, effective regulation. And I'm here as the uh, embodiment of that particular aspect of our, of our program. Two days ago, I was in Detroit where I'd been invited to give a keynote talk at the largest international gathering of automotive designers and engineers in the world at the Society of Automotive Engineers. This is a collection, really, of some of the best, most innovative minds and companies working together in the auto industry who are now busily engaged in developing cleaner, more advanced, lower carbon vehicles. They're doing it with just tremendous enthusiasm and commitment, and they're also doing it in ways that make sense for their companies. And I think in large part, they're doing it in response to smart policy and effective regulations that started here in California. In 2002, the California legislature adopted a law that required ARB to develop regulations to cut greenhouse gas emissions from passenger vehicles. We developed a rule that was designed to carefully, steadily push the industry to producing cleaner, less polluting vehicles. We did it based on what we knew about what was technologically and economically feasible, and we also designed it in a way that would give the companies flexibility to comply in the ways that suited them best. Unlike some of our previous experiences in working with the companies on air pollution, however, this time uh, with some encouragement from the then federal administration, uh, the auto industry dug in its heels. And they fought us every step of the way on our efforts to implement these regulations. We heard every possible argument that you could think of, including those that we still sometimes hear today, including you have no legal authority to do this, it's too expensive, the technology doesn't exist, it's going to be bad for business, it's going to be bad for our competitiveness, and last but not least, of course, global warming isn't really real, or if it is, it's not our fault. Well, uh, as you all know, uh, and have heard the story because we are so happy to keep telling it, over time, the auto industry came to realize what we had believed all along, which is that they could do it. Not only could they do it, they had to do it if they were going to remain competitive in a global economy which prices uh, fuel uh, at closer to its real value than we do here in the United States, and that they could produce cleaner, more efficient vehicles that customers actually want. As a result, we now have not just a California standard, we have a national standard for vehicles that will dramatically improve fuel efficiency and cut greenhouse gas emissions over, as well as other air pollutants over the next decade, and will put billions of dollars back in consumers' pockets uh, from savings at the pump in the process. Last year, when the president announced these new rules, standing behind him in support, were representatives from the largest automakers in the world. And I can't really think of a better example of the way in which good policy and well-designed regulations are working together to produce real results in our efforts to address the challenge of climate change. 
Now, these rules don't say anything about zero emission vehicles, the program that uh, Cliff referenced in his remarks earlier. The zero emission vehicle mandate is a separate California program that is designed to continue the push, not just for cleaner conventional vehicles, but to go beyond what is currently thinkable, uh, even though we've continued to push ourselves beyond what was thinkable in one decade uh, every time we've gone back and revisited the standards. The fact is that in order to sustain investment in uh, transportation systems, combinations of vehicles and fuels that are fully zero emission vehicle from cradle to grave, um, you need an additional push. Uh, tailpipe standards alone, cafe type standards alone won't do the job, which is why we've continued to um, promote the zero emission vehicle program. And it is a challenge for the companies. There's no doubt about it. But that in turn leads to, I think, um, some of what I'm going to talk about a little bit more further, which is an increasing dynamic that I see happening uh, here in California and elsewhere, which is a recognition that with smart regulation also comes uh, activity on the part of government to align all of our policies and programs in ways that can support the kinds of transformations that we're looking for. Because we fully expect that in 2050, there's going to be plenty of gasoline-powered uh, vehicles still on the roads. They'll be extremely clean and extremely efficient, but we will still be burning uh, petroleum that comes out of the ground uh, to get some of our vehicles around, especially some of the uh, heavier, uh, the heavier vehicles. And so we've got to do more dramatic things if we're going to make the kind of breakthroughs that we know are technologically possible. And for that, we need a mix of other kinds of incentives and programs. This type of approach that we used in the uh, vehicle emissions is exactly, uh, I think, the kind, of, uh, the kind of approach that is going to get us to the goals of AB 32 and beyond uh, in the years to come. And it really uh, epitomizes, I think, uh, an approach which involves clear goal setting, a very open and transparent regulatory process, and the ability to make adjustments when you need to along the way to keep relevant, to recognize current science, recognize better data, and make uh, changes as you need to along the way while continuing to move forward towards, towards the goal. When I was here at this conference a year ago, the big question that everybody was asking was, are you guys really going to go forward with the cap and trade program? There was a huge amount of skepticism. Um, I wouldn't say downright disbelief, but certainly an awful lot of need for reassurance that something was actually going to happen. And people kept asking me, so what's the governor say? What has he really told you? What does he really think? Is he really going to let you go ahead and do this program? Well, I'm here to say that uh, my confidence uh, in us uh, all was justified. And of course, we did start the program up fully, successfully. We've had two auctions. We've got another one right around the corner. And I'd like to be able to tell you what an exciting, thrilling ride it's been uh, to get there. But I can't actually do that, because the truth is, it's pretty boring. Um, it may not uh, feel that way to those of you who are in the market, but um, for those of us who actually run the program, there's a couple of people who go into a locked room that the rest of us can't go into and sit in front of computer screens and watch the bidding take place. And then at the end, they come out and it's audited and a bunch of people tell us whether it's OK to go ahead. And um, that's it. That's, that's what happens. It's great that it's become routine so quickly. This is exactly what I dreamed of, what I hoped for, which was that this would become part of the fabric of our operations and that it would um, quickly pass from being uh, a dramatic thing to being, oh yeah, California has this cap and trade program and there's a, another auction coming up. I'm sorry, I just knocked something off of the podium here. I hope it doesn't destroy uh, the record that you're keeping. Um, so uh, what's, what's new, what's happening uh, now with this program? Well, first of all, of course, uh, we're going to be looking at some further amendments uh, to the program. Uh, we're working on uh, some refinements that we fall into the category of things that we think will 
make sure that we're um, being sensitive to any possible run-ups in prices of allowances that will help us make sure that the um, investments of the, uh, uh, that come to the state from uh, the auctions are uh, invested in ways that further our goals and um, in general that help us to support the overall goals of AB 32. In October, we're going to be looking at a package of amendments that um, will help the program function smoothly, in including uh, price issues, as I mentioned. Um, we're also going to be uh, looking at the way we allocate allowances again to make sure that as we move forward, we're doing this in ways that continue to push more in the direction of auctioning of allowances while at the same time recognizing the need that we have as a state, at least until we have uh, uh, more partners working with us on this program uh, to make sure that we're not doing anything that uh, would cause emissions leakage as a result of the program. We're also taking some big steps forward on offset protocols. I know it's painfully slow for those who are in the business of developing uh, offsets or are hoping to um, attain them, but we are, in fact, uh, moving forward with great deliberation in this area because we are so concerned that uh, whatever we do here in California will be the benchmark for the rest of the world and that our offsets will uh, not be able to be uh, successfully challenged once we actually approve them. Um, earlier this year, we did approve the, Cali the uh, Climate Action Reserve and the American Carbon Registry as offset project registries. That's a key piece of making the offset program work. We've trained and accredited uh, verifiers by the dozens, and we're moving now in a fairly uh, routine way towards bringing early action offset projects into the program so that they can be used for compliance by companies that need them. We have two offset protocols, the ones on uh, coal mine methane and rice cultivation that are going to be coming to the board this year and we're going to be issuing soon, I'm told, I don't have a date for you, uh, the very first offset uh, credits for a compliance offset project under this program. We know we need to keep looking for additional uh, innovative offset projects and categories that can cut emissions and bring new partners into the effort. And as this um, auctioning and uh, administration of the cap and trade program becomes more routine and boring, as I suggested. Uh, it frees us up to become more engaged in looking at potential for new kinds of offsets and for international uh, projects as well. But there are some categories that we have right now that are available that aren't being utilized to the extent that they should be. And I'm here uh, today to uh, make a commitment that I will personally give an award to anybody who brings forward an urban forestry project under the protocol that we have approved because I think that's one that is just ripe for, um, for investment and for success. Um, this week, we're going to be voting at the board on uh, a regulation designed to um, allow for linkage between our cap and trade program and the program that's being developed in Quebec. Um, the hallmark, a hallmark of our program from the very beginning has been a commitment to work with other states and countries to try to tackle some of these projects together. While I don't know that there's a huge um, wave of momentum towards the kind of full linkage that we are uh, pursuing with Quebec, we're also looking seriously at other kinds of linkages with other uh, states and nations that are interested uh, in market-based programs. But we are particularly excited and proud that we've come to the point where it looks as though, based on the findings that we've received from the governor and the advice of the attorney general, that the board will be in a position to approve a full linkage uh, that would take effect um, at the beginning of next year. So that's a major uh, milestone, I think, in the evolution of this, of this program. Another really important milestone, I believe, is the release of the investment plan that has now been posted uh, by ARB. Uh, it's also on the uh, governor's or the Department of Finance's uh, website. Uh, we take very seriously the responsibility of ensuring that the proceeds of the auctions are invested wisely in support of California's uh, climate and clean energy goals. The uh, plan that we released 
is one that was worked on by a, a, a handful, two handfuls at least, of, um, of agencies of the state of California. Uh, it's uh, released in draft form because we expect to get more comment and to have, uh, of course, ultimately um, a formal adoption as part of the governor's budget and then uh, dialogue with the uh, legislature as well but we were extremely pleased that the uh, release of this document was greeted with uh, praise coming from the uh, Speaker of the California Assembly. That was definitely a, a positive uh, reinforcement for our efforts to try to make sure that as we look at the proceeds of AB 32 in a way that fully meets the requirements of supporting uh, the, the goals of AB 32, that it also simultaneously makes sure that every dollar that we have to put into new investment is also supporting our uh, related goals of cleaner, more efficient transportation and energy, resource protection, air quality, and uh, particularly towards making sure that the benefits of this program are felt in California's most disadvantaged communities. The uh, energy sector, which has been referenced earlier as a, as a key, of course, uh, here and around the world, um, as, a, as the most um, focused area for uh, cleaning up greenhouse gas emissions and paving the way for uh, future economic development. This has been a hallmark, I would say, of Governor Brown's um, thinking about environmental and economic issues uh, ever since I worked for him in his very first administration with, at the very outset of some of California's uh, landmark efficiency and renewable energy policies. And it's sort of obvious if you think about it, but um, the reality is that um, we don't get to maintain California's levels of growth without finding ways to do it with energy that is as close to uh, non-emitting as possible because our need for um, environmental protection, our need for uh, protecting what makes California uh, precious to people who come here, uh, clear skies, a pristine coastline, doesn't happen without uh, getting every ounce of efficiency, efficiency that we can out of our uh, system, and that in turn means uh, we already have a head start in terms of our commitment to reducing greenhouse gases as well. I don't want to dwell any more on those uh, programs and our successes here other than to say that it's a process of continuous improvement that you cannot just rest on 20% or 33% or 50%. You have to keep looking at what you've achieved and what can be achieved by further pushing the goals out. And while that may seem um, uh, frustrating or counterintuitive um, to those in the regulated community, if you think about it um, from a longer term perspective, it only makes sense to try to incorporate what we learn to set new benchmarks and to keep moving. It's just, it's a sensible way uh, to plan. But again, as Cliff indicated in his remarks, our greatest challenge in reducing our greenhouse gases is the transportation sector. We are not, as a state, uh, a highly uh, industrialized state, even though we're the home to a very vibrant manufacturing sector. But 40% of our greenhouse gases come from the fuels that we use to power cars, trains, trucks, and buses. And in turn, they're related to the way that we design and build our community. California famously is the home of uh, sprawling development. And this sector as a whole is even more responsible for uh, public health problems and for a drain on the economy as a result of delays that people experience in congestion, uh, the penalty that people pay for having to drive uh, hundreds of miles in some cases to find affordable housing. These problems, these issues are linked to each other and they're all linked together. Um, as a result of our commitments on climate, which has given us a new tool and a new basis really for working on some of these issues that environmentalists have recognized and tried to address in a more uh, piecemeal fashion in some cases uh, for many, many years. The greenhouse gas vehicle uh, standards are an example of uh, one area where obviously we have made a lot of progress. 
we have a regulation uh, that requires one out of every seven new vehicles that are sold by 2025 to be a zero emission vehicle. And the governor has reinforced that target with an executive order uh, that calls for a 1.5 million, for 1.5 million zero emission vehicles to be in California by 2025 and has put behind that um, some serious uh, action commitments on the part of all the agencies that play a role in facilitating the addition of the kinds of infrastructure and purchasing decisions that are gonna have to be made to, to uh, reinforce that goal. We have companies uh, here in California right now, including our uh, beloved Tesla Motors, that are already taking advantage of these rules. There's also a tremendous amount of good work being done by communities at the local and regional levels to develop and plan more sustainable communities. They've been given a push in this direction, obviously, by AB 32, SB 375, the prospect of some funding coming in from um, the cap and trade auction programs. But the reality is that there's many, many forces that are pushing in the direction of more sustainable kinds of development that increase mobility options and improve transportation and land use efficiencies, uh, not just because they help cut greenhouse gases, but because they help people live a freer and more healthy lifestyle, which increasingly is what people are demanding. Uh, we simply can't uh, continue to expect that young people are gonna want to have to uh, buy a car and need to have a car to uh, to get around in most of our cities, and people are voting with their uh, feet, literally, or perhaps their bicycle pedals, uh, that they don't want to uh, be as auto dependent as they have been in the past. Nevertheless, we do continue to burn fuel, and that's the heart of what our greenhouse gas emissions uh, program is all about. We have a rule in place uh, called the Low Carbon Fuel Standard, which has been getting a lot of attention recently because it's been the target of an opposition uh, campaign by, uh, by the oil industry, uh, led by some of the same folks who helped to develop that rule in the first place. Um, unfortunately, we're, I think we're going through another one of those um, cyclical um, uh, processes that we seem to go through, uh, where there's a bit of testing going on here. Uh, but the reality is that this program is actually beginning to deliver uh, investments in cleaner fuels. They came in, um, in some cases, uh, a little more expensive or a little less uh, speedily than some had predicted at the beginning, which is always the case when you're beginning uh, startups with new technologies. Uh, but the reality is that the investments that have already been made are paying off and that new investments are uh, coming in uh, almost on a daily basis with announcements of startup uh, companies sometimes using very innovative technologies, sometimes using old, well-recognized technologies that can be used to produce fuels that will, um, liquid fuels that will power conventional engines, but do it at much lower carbon cost than conventional petroleum. And that actually includes, uh, somewhat surprisingly, I think, but an example of how sometimes life surprises us, um, you know, the use of uh, abundant natural gas to a much greater extent in the transportation sector than people had uh, predicted just a couple of years ago when there was great confidence that there were never going to be major increases in uh, natural gas supplies. So I think um, the basic message of that, of all of that is that by setting strong targets, by continually checking and affirming those targets, and by maintaining a commitment to using regulation to reinforce our policy goals, we can get there. It can be done. We are enthusiastic about the moves on the part of the federal EPA in that same direction. Uh, we are uh, looking forward eagerly uh, to Gina McCarthy's confirmation as the next administrator of EPA because we would like to help her work with us and other states to put together an effective program, not necessarily identical to what California has done, but something that we can uh, work with. And um, we are excited about the prospect if we just all keep pushing and uh, keep working together. So I wanna thank all of you for your continuing commitment and work 
uh, on these projects. I see many of you in other contexts all the time. Others of you I know have come from farther afield and we don't get to work together all the time, but I know you're out there and very much appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Stay up there? Yeah. People have questions or they want to come up to the microphones. We'll we'll take a few moments. Anyone? <laughs> You've answered it all. Uh, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> no, I'm sure they'll be oh, we have one here from from our friend from Cal. Shiva Swaminathan, City of Palo Alto Utilities. Uh, thank you for being here. I have uh, two questions in terms of 2020 goals. What would 2020 look like if, it's a, if this program proves to be successful? I'm sorry, I didn't What would year 2020 look like if all these programs we are putting in place to reduce emissions to meet the 2020 target? How would you judge the success of the program in year ah, 2020? I see. I see. And the second part of the same question is, um, how, what path are we taking to get to the 2050 goal? Well, we're trying to think as we move forward towards 2020, about 2050 as well, so we don't do anything that sends us off in a wrong direction. That would definitely be a, a mistake that we would regret later on. So uh, when I mentioned the investment plan, for example, I didn't go into any great detail about what's in it, but uh, we're looking at both short-term uh, meaning just in the next couple of years, programs that could reduce uh, emissions, but also at the kinds of longer-term investments that may not pay off right away. I think one of the sadder lessons of the early days of our Clean Air Act experience has been that because we set such short-term deadlines for attainment of air quality standards, always um, investments or regulations that involve land use uh, fell off the table because they don't deliver results immediately. It takes more time to actually get there. And yet we know that by 2050, um, if we haven't done things that have uh, protected our agricultural and forest lands, if we haven't done things to uh, promote infill development, uh, that we will in fact miss the targets of 2050. So it, that's what I'm looking for, but when you ask me, how is it going to look in 2020? I'm not sure that those changes will be apparent on the ground. I think the plans will be in place and we'll be starting to realize some of those benefits. We'll be starting to see more uh, conservation projects, more, uh, more uh, investments in things that take a long time to build, like a high-speed rail program, but they won't all be completely built out and um, you know, completely in effect in the year 2020, but I think we'll, we'll be measurably on our way. And we will meet, by the way, the 2020 goal, which is getting back to 1990 uh, levels by 2020. I think we're quite confident that with the regulations that are on the books right now, we will be able to meet those goals. So I think that's what success looks like. Hi, my name is Xantha Brusso, and I'm with Pacific Gas and Electric Company. I wanted to thank you for your candor answering all of our questions and also your practicality in implementing 8032 so that it's a, su a successful program. Um, but I do want to follow up on one of your comments about linkage and you had mentioned that there could be other kinds of linkages with the jurisdictions that are in a position um, similar to ours with, with climate change policies in place. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Well, um, yeah, let me give you an example of something um, that we might, uh, well, we are talking about now with the government of Australia, which is uh, beginning the process of implementing a cap and trade program in Australia. They've actually joined up with the EU carbon trade, emissions trading program. As I understand it, their plan is that they will be fully members of that program. Um, we don't see ourselves joining with that program because of the over allocation issues and other problems that we would have from a legal and administrative perspective in being fully linked in one big market with them. But there's a lot that we could do short of that kind of linkage that would help both of us um, if, for example, we were to pursue some international emissions tracking uh, efforts 
if we were to pool our information on the enforcement side, uh, particularly when it comes to the use of offsets, and um, in other ways strengthen uh, the knowledge base that exists around the world on the part of communities where there are concerns about these cap and trade programs and what their impact could be on adjoining uh, communities around facilities that might uh, potentially um, be seen as a, being allowed to emit more pollution as a result of a cap and trade program. So these are issues that keep popping up. They're issues of real concern uh, everywhere. And um, there are things where uh, a much stronger basis for trading uh, information, uh, not just sort of once a year getting together and swapping stories, but you know, formally and in a very transparent way, uh, putting out information could be very helpful to all of us. So that's the kind of linking that we're that we're thinking about where to go next. That's it. Does anyone have any more questions? Okay. Thank you.